Welcome back to the Hour View podcast. On today's episode, I welcome my guest, Judy Human. Judy was diagnosed with polio at the age of 18 months, and she has since dedicated her life's work to advocating for the rights of those who have disabilities. Join us in our conversation as we take an intergenerational look at our lives growing up with a disability. Thank you for joining me for this uh, episode of the podcast, Our View Podcast. I um, welcome you, uh, Judy Human, to my podcast. And uh, I really have followed you for uh, so long and the work that you have done to help improve the lives of those who have disabilities. And uh, I like to start off my podcast by asking my guests to introduce themselves because um, for me, I, you know, people say they know you and they've uh, read things and, and heard about you, but I think you can best describe yourself uh, to the audience uh, in a few words. <laughs> uh, first, thanks a lot, Arthur. I really appreciate um, being asked to do this program with you. And for the audience, um, I am a white disabled woman, and this is uh, not visual, but I'll give you the descriptor. I'm wearing a pink sweater and I'm in the foyer of our um, apartment, which is where I live with my husband and two roommates and also where our office is. And I have two people uh, that work with me, Stevie and Becca. And then, you know, COVID allows us to see other people's places. And so I'm, you know, looking at Arthur Aspen who's wearing this great shirt that says Our View, the name of the program. But of note for me is that O is um, a wheelchair uh, rider. So there's a stick figure in the wheelchair actively pushing. And um, it's on, is that a green yes. shirt? Or, yeah, so it's a green, looks like velour turtleneck. I love it. And behind him is a bookcase, and on the bookcase are two uh, black disabled dolls. I think one uh, young girl and one young boy. And uh, the boy is using crutches and braces. He's got a green top and uh, sitting down. And the girl um, is sitting in a wheelchair. She's got, I think, big pigtails. And the wheelchair is a manual wheelchair. Doesn't exactly fit her, but um, because it wasn't designed that way, but a great wheelchair and um, and then he's got a great painting in the background, which I can't completely tell, but it looks like it's a beach scene and uh, some boats and lovely trees. So as I'm talking to you, we're looking at the scenes uh, in our apartments. Um, who am I? I think I'm a networker. I love people. I've been involved in the movement. I'm 72 and a half. I'll be 73 in December. I can't believe I'm this old. It's not old. I love being old. It's not a criticism of being old. But I started out in my 20s when I was definitely one of the youngest people with my friends in the room as we were taking on older people who were um, not in many cases disabled individuals, but non-disabled individuals who really saw us as young Turks or as some defined communists because we were trying to uh, make reforms that we've been enacting over the last number of decades with further work to do. And um, I'm an activist and there isn't any one time in my life that made me say, oh, I need to be an activist. I think it's something that just occurred naturally or unnaturally and unnaturally because of the types of discrimination that I and my disabled friends were experiencing in the 50s. Um, not being able to go to school because I was deemed a fire hazard. Having a teacher come to the house in Brooklyn, New York for two and a half hours a week, considering that to be an equivalent education, which was 
less than a week than kids got in one single day. And then just, I think how I learned from my parents and my friends and my friends' parents and how if people were not advocating for change, it wouldn't happen. So I would say I'm an advocate for change who's really been um, fortunate to have worked with great disabled people in New York, in California, nationally and inter internationally, where we all have a similar, vi similar vision of um, justice and civil and human rights and the empowerment of the voices of disabled people. Uh, I'm one of the founders of the Center for Independent Living in Berkeley and have been involved with the National Council on Independent Living for many decades now and many others and the International Disability Rights Movement uh, with the Centers for Independent Living uh, emerging around the world. I want to just say one other thing. I really feel that one of the reasons why we've been able to make the advancements we have um, is based on the fact that we've been becoming a growing uh, movement of diversity. You know, in the beginning, when I was growing up, and still in many ways, our disabilities have been the stovepipes that we've lived in. And I think the movement itself has really made us recognize, or many of us recognize that we experience discrimination differently depending on who we are and who the totality of who we are is. But at the end of the day, discrimination is discrimination and it limits the opportunities uh, for people. And it also limits our belief in ourselves, always having to be fighting, uh, not just on the day-to-day -day level for what our vision for ourselves is, but then really the stigma that we experience as disabled individuals who are Black, Latino, Asian, religious minorities, uh, sexual orientations that are not considered typical on and on. So. Our movement, I think, is, can be a leader and is being a leader um, in really recognizing where we are and where we yet need to go. Yeah, I, um, I definitely agree. It, it's, you know, like you said, discrimination is discrimination. And for me, being an African-American male uh, who also has a disability, which is a visible disability, I, I'm a wheelchair user and I also use crutches. Um, so you see me coming, uh, either on my crutches or in my wheelchair, and I've, I've had experiences where I've been dismissed and I've always, um, you know, I, I always have to question why is it because I have a disability? Is it because I'm African-American? Uh, the job is that I have, both? is it both? Right. Yeah. The job that I have, I, I work for a nonprofit that, uh, builds inclusive playgrounds and one of the sites where we have a playground has a, a large pavilion area that people often rent out for events. And I had an experience where there were um, three men in business suits and they were walking around looking. And so I went over to them and I said, oh, is there anything I can help you guys with? They were looking at the playground and the pavilion and they said, um, oh no, we're okay, we're, we're fine. And I was uh, with my coworkers <laughs> who are Caucasian and they- um, I'm sorry, were they disabled or non-disabled? No, they were non-disabled. And so you were in your wheelchair or on crutches? I was in my wheelchair. So you were a black man in a wheelchair. Yes, and then uh, maybe and 10 the minutes three, later. And the three people uh, that were walking around, what were they? They were uh, non-disabled Caucasian men and they were, um, they, they came over to where we were, to, to where our group was maybe 10 minutes later and talked to one of the non-disabled Caucasian men to ask them about the playground and about the uh, pavilion and how to, you know, if they could rent it out for their uh, work event. And thankfully my coworker who was always quick with a response, he said, oh sure, you can speak to our executive director, Art Aston, right here. <laughs> Are you the executive director? Yes. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. So he, um, you know, he said, oh, sure. Yeah. You know, um, our, our executive director, Art Aston, he can help you out with that. You know, absolutely. No problem. And their faces were just like, oh, no. Like they, you know, they realized. 
I'm, so I, I always do, yeah, I always have to think, is it because I'm disabled or because I'm black or like you said, is it because I'm, I'm both? Um, but yeah, being, being a part of the movement of uh, attempting to create change in the world is um, something that I'm, I'm very passionate about as well. Um, one thing uh, we, we talked briefly before we started recording, uh, we had a discussion yesterday uh, about the differences in our education experiences coming up. Uh, as you mentioned, you had, you had home instruction um, until you were in uh, fourth grade, correct? That's correct. Yeah, and- um, In the middle of the fourth grade. And, and then, then I went you- went to segregated classes. And you went to segregated classes, kids. right? Only for disabled kids. Yeah, um, and my experience with school was completely, um, almost completely the opposite of that. I, I did an early intervention uh, program uh, through a, a local school here in, in New Jersey called Kingsway. Um, I believe I was three or four years old, and what then were you born? I was born in 1981, and I was born in 1947. So yeah. in 1981, as we were discussing yesterday, was six years after what was then called the edu the education EHA, Education Handicap, whatever. Today it's mm -hmm. called the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, and Section 504 had been signed into law in 1973. So in 81, you were beginning to benefit from these laws that no one even thought about in the 1950s. Right, yeah, and that's what, um, you know, hear, hearing, um, I read your book, or I listened to your audio book that was uh, read by uh, someone I've become friends with, Ali Stroker, and, um, you know, hearing your experience of being in the segregated classrooms with others who had disabilities, and you were in the basement of the school. Um, yeah. yeah, so that was, uh, you know, like you, you said, a different- the basement of the school. So let me just, so we're in the uh -huh. basement of the school, the cafeteria and the gym was right down the hall from our classes. We were not allowed to eat lunch with the non-disabled kids and we never went to gym with the others. We only integrated with the kids on Fridays if there was an assembly. Wow. So, See, and then, and like that, that goes back to the conversation we were just having about the discrimination and the segregation of, of the people with disabilities. And it's just, um, it's, it's amazing. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm grateful for the work that you have done to, uh, you know, help create those changes so that, uh, you know, there's more integration of uh, classrooms and schools these, you know, in the present time. And my experience, I went to public school from kindergarten all the way through high school. And uh, I was never in the, uh, in a segregated classroom. We had them in our, in our schools. But um, as part of the individuals, uh, the IDEA, uh, you know, I was able to benefit from uh, certain things and, uh, you know, having longer test times and, and things like that for tests and, and being in, uh, in different, you know, in a different classroom sometimes to take a test if, if that's what I needed. And uh, having those needs met that I, you know, that were specific to me and not just a uh, generalization, I guess, for, you know, other people all in, in one group, I think and was we were very important. Yesterday when we were talking about our schools. So yes. the high school that I went to, my graduating class had 1,700 kids. And your graduating class had how many? I think we were maybe 300 or 400 maybe. <laughs> yeah. And I think my number may be low. But yeah. um, so, and you, like you knew each other, right? From- Yes. Was in the neighborhood and- you yes. went through elementary school together. That, for me, in New York was, because none of the schools that I went to were in the neighborhood. So I went to one elementary school, and then the high school that I went to was nowhere near my house. Oh, so there was wow. no like, socializing afterwards with the kids. But anyway. Yeah, yeah. see, and that's, that's interesting um, as well. You, you mentioned uh, in your book that you were the only uh, Per, the only child with a disability in your neighborhood. And um, 
how how did how was that um growing up with other kids who uh, didn't have disabilities were you able to participate in a lot of their uh in a lot of their activities did they include you in things or were you excluded yeah so um I'll answer, then you answer your experiences. Yes. <laughs> um, because I think this, when we were talking yesterday about preparing for the program, um, it seemed really valuable that, you know, we're intergenerational, right? You're much younger than I am. You're 39, I'm going to be 73. And so listening to these experiences. Um, in my neighborhood, it was um, a middle-class neighborhood in Brooklyn. And um, they were all small private homes, either attached or detached. And my parents had moved in, um, in, I guess, 1948, I was born in December of 47. And they moved to Brooklyn when I was three months old. And as had, it was after the Second World War. And so there were a number of families who had recently moved in or had only been there a few years and had kids. And so it was kind of a close knit uh, area. And um, there were numbers of families that were having children. So when I had polio, people knew my family and they knew me. And my mother was pregnant with my brother. She was eight months pregnant when I had polio. Um, so after being in and out of the hospital for a number of years, um, I was really a part of the neighborhood. And um, my neighbors were our friends, the kids played together, I played with them. Um, I was in a brownie troop, which was up the block. I'm Jewish, there's a church up the block that had the brownie troop. And, um, and we played together and we, like learned how to make accommodations. So I remember I wore braces at that point and used a wheelchair, which I still do. I don't wear braces anymore. Um, and I remember my friends putting skates on my feet and another friend, you know, roller skating and pushing my wheelchair. And even did that once when they froze over this little, we had a little backyard, froze it over and people were ice skating and put ice skates on my feet. Oh, wow. And we just, like once, we just accommodated like the Girl Scout brownie games and things. And I would turn the rope because I didn't jump. But, you know, I remember when I was younger, both with my family and, and my uncles and aunts and kids, and in that part of the uh, neighborhood, we were, we were just all friends. And my disability, obviously affected things like the houses weren't accessible and how we had to scream out you know, to call a friend out or, um, you know, be lifted into the house, those things. But of course that all started to slowly change as education was denying me what other kids were getting. And I think really at that point, it was beginning to like, why is this happening? And it was a gradual transition for me as I was getting older to start thinking about the fact that I was being treated differently because I used a wheelchair. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah. Yeah, for me, uh, I grew up in a very small suburban town outside of uh, Philadelphia in, in New Jersey. And um, very small town. I, I, my elementary school had a hundred, maybe 120 kids total from kindergarten through sixth grade. Uh, you know, and we were all very close and, uh, a majority of, uh, outside of school, I had, um, I have a very large family. My dad is, is one of 10 children. My mom is one of seven. Um, my That's maternal, great. my maternal grandmother was one of 14. Um, so I have a very large family. So a lot of my friends uh, growing up and even still to today are, are my relatives, my cousins. Do they, live, do they live in the same area? Yes, yes. A lot of us uh, are still in, in the same area and um, outside of the uh, pandemic, if, if they don't live inside in, in New Jersey, we travel to see each other in, in Maryland and 
uh, California and, and everywhere. So we, uh, you know, so that was my experience of being, you know, around friends and, and in my neighborhood and in my family. Like you said, of course, your disability was known and everybody knew it, but uh, they made accommodations. I always went to the playground with them and, uh, you know, same thing with skating. I, I did have uh, more uh, mobility in my leg. So um, they actually put me on skates. <laughs> Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, to do some roller skating. Uh, I, I do remember that and I have pictures of that. Uh, one of the local um, organizations in uh, my mom's old neighborhood uh, where they did like youth programs and things like that. They had a skating party every uh, holiday season around Christmas. So they would, you know, they would take me there and, and we would, they would put on skates and I would, you know, wheel around with somebody holding my hands up to, you know, help me get around. and. Uh, so it, it's really, uh, you know, like you said, the, uh, intergenerational uh, between the two of us, but having very similar, uh, having very similar uh, stories in, in that way, I think is really, really interesting. <laughs> and my family, so we're uh, Jewish and my family's from Germany. And so both sets of grandparents died in the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. And my mother's father, I had no siblings, and my mother's mother, or my like grandmother, she had a sister, and her family died. So on my mother's side of the family, we have not that many relatives. My father's side of the family, more relatives, but not at all like your family um, yeah. with so many relatives. But family, I think, was very important. You know, as you're talking about this, one thing I remember was that like in girl in brownies and girl scouts i never felt you know different until there was a trip that was organized for the girl scouts to go on to on a bus that wasn't accessible to ice skate and i remember not going uh because of all of that and so you know things started to pop up when activities were, um, as people, kids were getting older and people were doing different things, going on a bus, going on a train to get somewhere and I couldn't do that. So, whereas when I was younger, you know, we were, you know, we did everything together. As we got older, that started changing mm -hmm. and camp, so I've also recently been in this film documentary called Crip Camp on Netflix. Yes. Um, and as Arthur said, I have a book that uh, came out in February called Being Human, an Unrepentant Memoir of a Disability Rights Advocate or Activist, sorry. Um, so I think, you know, for those of us like you and myself who had our disabilities when we were younger, we have different experiences than for people who acquire their disabilities in their teens or 20s or older. And I think that's you know, also an important issue when we look at our movement that you, know, you and I grew up and I would say we had a pretty happy, healthy sense of who we were in the beginning. And as we got older, the, what was going on around us people's views of our not being equal, not being able to contribute the same. Um, but even there, that was somewhat changing because, you know, I went for four years, for the first four years of education, um, or three and a half years at home, and you were already in school at three, and then you were in integrated classes at five. So I think that's also important if you, felt a part of that community. Yes. So, so for me, when did you start feeling that your disability uh, was resulting in people treating you differently? I can say um, very, very similar to what you said, as you got older and the, um, the activities changed where, um, you know, I've, I have no idea 
how or why I got interested. I don't know if it was the, um, I, I won't say peer pressure, but the, um, the excitement from my family, but I was very into um, like amusement parks and roller coasters and things like that. Um, <laughs> so, uh, you know, and there have been a few times where, uh, because it's easier for me to use my wheelchair in amusement parks and, and places of where I have to walk for long distances, sure. uh, there have been uh, situations where I would go to get on a roller coaster and I had been on maybe three other roller coasters in the same park, but the one attendant at that one ride would say, oh, you can't get on. Huh. You know, and it's just like, what do you mean I can't get on? I was just on, you know, three other uh, rides here, three other roller coasters. Oh, well, you know, the, the rules say, you know, if you have uh, all these conditions, uh, you, you can't get on if you have back issues and they have the list there uh, you know, saying of, of medical conditions that, you know, shouldn't ride this ride. So, um, it's fine a bit, but it was not there. Right. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so that's when we, you know, would start, you know, trying to make a case for it. And it's, I understood their concern, uh, you know, and at the same time, it's like, if I want to, you know, take that chance and, you know, I think you should definitely let me take that chance because that was, you know, and that's, that's how I was raised with, um, you know, within my family. If you want to do it, you can do it, you know, as, as long as you're not, right. you know, as long that's as you're not, thing is, no. exactly. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and that was the other thing uh, that I wanted to go back to within my family. My family was so large, but I never realized that we, we very rarely talked about spina bifida and what it was, what it meant how it really impacted me. It was just, this is Arthur and this is who he is. This is Let what he has. Let me ask you a question about that mm -hmm. because very much I think I had a similar experience, but we did talk, you know, cause my family was Jewish, your family is black, were race issues something that were discussed in your family more than like disability? Not really. Um, okay. yeah, not, not really. Um, and we lived in, in very, uh, we lived in a very like inter integrated, uh, neighborhood, mm -hmm. uh, in my school, the schools I went to, we, you know, we had, uh, all, uh, nationalities, religions, and, um, you know, all that, um, uh, kind of thing. Uh, so we really, you know, at that time, I, I don't recall that we, you know, discussed it much, um. I was, I, I remember uh, back to the, uh, not talking about my disability, I was with one of my cousins who, on my mom's side, he is uh, a few years younger than me, um, out of my cousins, and we were in our 20s, and we were out one night, and um, he said, well, he was like, can you tell me what spina bifida is? And I said, what do you mean? <laughs> He said, well, what is it? He said, you never, you know, we, we never talked about it. Uh, it. We know that's what you have, but he said, I just know you were my older cousin who drove a car. So it was, <laughs> you know, it was, it was cool to me and, and my mom would let me go places, but uh, with you, but uh, you know, so that, that was interesting to me. So to have back to the, uh, you know, amusement park scene, to have somebody tell me that, you know, you can't, do something when you know all my life my family and friends have seen me doing things and so that's that's when I really uh, realized that it was you know like wait a minute people outside of my family don't see me the same as uh, you know the people I interact with on a, a regular basis so that was really um, really uh, shocking to me and then of course as I got older and into the working world um, I, I noticed it as well um, you know, the, the difference in the way that people uh, view you as, uh, you know, being a, a person with a disability and they assume your limitations without asking about them and just, um, you know, making, making decisions for you where, uh, where you can clearly, or where you're clearly capable of making them uh, on your own. I think that was uh, another, another really big thing for me as I, as I got older and, uh, you know, started looking for jobs and, and uh, applying for, for jobs. <laughs> no, I was going to say, I think, you know, 
stigma and people's perceptions of who we are and what we're able to do. God, your family is so big. It would be great to do a study on it. I'm not even joking, yeah. you know, because you were just Arthur. Um, and yet I suppose that, I mean, I was just Judy, but um, I did really um, want and need to discuss disability issues and what I was experiencing as I was getting older. And of course I could talk to my family about it, but it wasn't the same. It was really, um, for me, one of the few values of going to segregated education was I was meeting other disabled people mm -hmm. who were experiencing similar things that, you know, maybe you didn't experience. Um, because you're in a small community and that did did you find that there were people even when you were younger who said things about you that were negative or disparaging or did you ever feel that teachers or others had lesser expectations for you than others or did you pretty much through school feel like you know you do your part of the deal, they do their part of the deal, and they saw you as the same. I could say in my early elementary school years, um, that wasn't an issue because the school was so small. And, um, you know, a lot of the teachers, they didn't live in the town, but they lived locally enough um, that we were, you know, all very a, a close, like a, a small family, pretty much. Um, right. Before, you know, uh, this was the 1980s. So uh, for, as an example, uh, the school nurse who I'm still very close with uh, today, uh, I remember going, she had a, a, a house at the Jersey Shore and I would go and spend the weekend with her and her family sometimes, you know, at the Jersey Shore. So it was, yeah, I think in those years, I didn't experience that. But as I got into middle school and high school, I think the teachers, uh, you know, maybe questioned my, uh, my ability uh, to learn. And, and some subjects were difficult for me. Math was very difficult for me. Um, I don't know if, you know, I, I know a lot of people have struggles, difficulties with math. So I'm not saying it was because of my spina bifida diagnosis, or it's just my brain didn't want to understand numbers and, <laughs> and all those equations. Yeah. Um, but, and then I, I did have uh, some teachers who really you know, worked with me, understood that, and, you know, as they would with any other student, they, uh, you know, put in the extra time to, you know, uh, meet with me to help me try to understand things a, a lot better. So just uh, for, you know, the last part, I would like to get into the um, uh, employment, um, not issues, but a topic of employment. Uh, in your book, you uh, mentioned that you were denied employment by the New York City uh, Board of Education. You applied to be a teacher. And was that, the, uh, was that the first experience you had with being denied employment uh, based on your disability or? No, actually, I had applied for a job when I graduated from college. I don't even remember why I applied for this job, but it was a social work position. Mm -hmm. And um, it seemed interesting. And so I applied for it and I sent my resume in and I got a call and they did a phone interview and it went really well. And they almost gave me the job on the phone. And uh, then the person who was interviewing me uh, gave me a time and a, a place to go and have another interview, meet people. So when I get off the phone, I realized that I hadn't asked where the accessible entrance was, so or or if the you know place was accessible. So I called back and I said, "Oh, I I use a wheelchair and where's the accessible entrance?" And she said to me, "Oh, I'll get back to you." And then oh. she called me back and said, "No need to come in for another interview." Wow. So 
that was my first foray. Because when I was on campus, I went to Long Island University in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I had been, um, I, I'd worked in college. Um, I worked in the president's office and I had worked in the alumni office and I had done work in the, uh, they had a speech therapy um, program and I was, my major was in speech and theater with a concentration on speech therapy. So I had done all those things. And then when I was also, I guess in my, I think my freshman and sophomore year, uh, in the summers I had worked at, um, as a social worker uh, or, you know, an intern social worker at a place called the William Reed Day Center for Senior Citizens. So I'd really worked a lot, you know, um, while I was in college. And then when I graduated, I was working in the alumni office as I was applying to the teaching position and then had applied to the social work position. So end of the day, um, those were my first uh, experiences interviewing for jobs where people didn't know me. I mean, at the college campus, you know, people knew me, and I don't even remember how I got the job in the president's office, but I loved the job in the president's office, and I was a receptionist. Uh, oh, but okay. <laughs> I loved that job because I was at the front desk, so I knew so many things about what were going on, you know. I was yeah. handling the one day the FBI came, they, and it was like hysterical. They came like literally in these trench coats. <laughs> it was so funny. Um, but no, the, I, and I love that. And I was on student council and yeah, so I was very active on campus and then went into the real world and yep, job discrimination in my face. Yeah, and that's- um... No law, and there were no laws. Right. At that time, there were no laws to protect you from uh, from uh, discrimination. So that was, um, and I think that's what really uh, struck me because yeah, I, I was born in 1981. And, you know, as a child, I don't remember uh, discrimination. But then with the Americans with Disabilities Act, um, you know, I was old enough to, to be aware of what it meant and um, the creation of it all. And so just to, to read your story and to know that uh, those types of laws didn't exist back then to prevent from, uh, against discrimination, it was, and, and the way that you fought that. Uh, and do you recall the first time that you experienced discrimination? And we talked yesterday, one of the things we talked about was camp. Yes. Um, one summer you went to a camp for disabled kids. I went to camp for disabled kids for many years. My experience was I loved going to these camps with disabled kids because I felt so comfortable and your experience was different, right? Yes, so my, my experience, um, because as, as I mentioned earlier, um, all of my friends who I was around uh, consistently as a child, they were all non-disabled uh, children. So I didn't really have the experience of being around others who were like me, who looked like me, uh, as far as using crutches, having spina bifida. I did belong to the local chapter of the Spina Bifida Association, and we went on, you know, a few trips. I remember we went to, you know, the zoo and the circus a few times and, uh, you know, How small you outings. How did you feel when you were with them? How did I feel with them? I felt really great because they they looked like me and we could you know we could talk about uh things and this was when I was probably my preteen years or so and uh you know we could share experiences of surgeries and things that we had and uh you know those types of things and and just how school was going and and what we didn't like or what we liked about school and uh just hearing similar stories that was uh really great for me because it, it I, I was able to relate to them on a different level uh, than people who uh, I was used to encountering and, uh, you know, having friendships with who didn't have the disabilities. Um, so that was, that was a good uh, experience for me. I think my camp experience was 
very overwhelming for me because it was a larger number of, uh, of children who had disabilities who were more, uh, their, their diagnosis were uh, more severe than mine, where they needed more uh, care from the uh, camp counselors and nurses who were there. Um, like cerebral palsy. Um, cerebral palsy and um, other That's diagnosis. Yeah, that I, um, you know, I, I wouldn't know the names of, of them at that time. Um, but I noticed, like, for instance, they would need help, assistance with eating, and, um, you know, they would have need assistance going to the restroom. And I couldn't relate to that because I wasn't, um, that wasn't my experience. How old were you at that time? Oh, I was probably 11 or 12 or so. And it was a two week camp and they, uh, my parents, um, I, I didn't want to stay because I, I was so uncomfortable, um, you know, and I, I felt like it wasn't for me. Um, and I felt like, you know, my, my space could be taken by someone else who, you know, really needed that type of care. Um, and I, I did end up going home uh, after, after a week. I did. Wow. Um, yeah. So I, I did end up going home after a week, but they, you know, my dad, he was like, we're not like, you're staying, you're, you're staying here, you know, you'll enjoy it. You'll get used to uh, the routine and it's just different for you and, you know, stick it out. You can do it. And I just really, um, I really couldn't. And on top of that, I think being that my circle of people were family members, it was really my first time being away from home too, for, you know, what was supposed to be a two week thing. So that was really, uh, overwhelming for me. And, um, you know, I guess I, I wouldn't know it at the time, but looking back, I would probably say a cause of anxiety for me, um, you know, because it was, I was around people I didn't know, and it was supposed to be for two weeks, and I'm two hours from home, so <laughs> uh, all of that on top of everything just uh, did not uh, sit well with me at that, <laughs> at that time, <laughs> mm -hmm. but uh, yeah, so it, it's really, um, you know, and it was really, interesting for me to uh, have that experience because it was something very new for me and I didn't know uh, at the time I didn't know something like that existed a camp for people who had disabilities and uh, you know as I got older I, I knew that they were uh, very common things and then of course as you mentioned uh, watching your documentary a few months ago on uh, Crip camp, Crip on, camp Netflix. on Netflix yeah that was uh, very, you know, very eye-opening for me to see that whole experience and how it went on um, for so long, for so many years, and just, um, you know, just a, a place where everybody could get together and, you know, uh, congregate together with uh, others who were like them is, uh, you know, it's such a, a great thing. And now I, as an adult, of course, I can see uh, the importance of that, of, um, you know, being around people who are who are like you in the uh, in the way of having disabilities? I mean, the you know part of it is when you relate the fact that you when you had when you went on activities with the Spiny Bifida Association and were they like day trips? Yes. Yeah. So I think you know you're talking a little bit about your family and how it's your family and overnight it was probably a combination of being away from your family and your extended family, which was probably an issue. And then, I mean, because there are people with spina bifida who have, are more significantly disabled than you are, but right. I guess the norm is not that. In school. I studied psychology. Uh -huh. So I have a master's in psychology and uh -huh. um, my goal for my my plan was to help families who are impacted by disabilities because I felt like that was something that my family missed out on. Um, you know, and I don't know if it was, I don't know if it was offered to my family and my family, um, you know, turned it down or if it just wasn't something that was brought up to my family. But uh, as I grew up and got older and became an adult, I could definitely see the benefits of uh, where counseling would have helped uh, helped my family. I have an older sister who doesn't have a disability. 
um, and just seeing how, you know, my parents had to, um, the, the challenge and, you know, with siblings anyway, uh, you know, parents have to uh, give more to, to others than, uh, give more to some of their children than others. And mine was in the medical way because I had surgeries and uh, recovery time. So a lot of time was spent with me. Uh, and I think uh, having a counseling, uh, you know, a, a routine of, of counseling for family counseling, I think that would have been uh, beneficial to my, uh, to my family. The issue I have with that though, with majoring in psychology is a lot of counseling has uh, gone to uh, in-home counseling or uh, off-site. Yeah, vir virtual now, but uh, you know, even before that, it's, it's, it was you're going to the home to see the clients. And oh. um, yeah, so with me oh. being a wheelchair user and using crutches, that's fine if your house is one floor. And I can, you know, if you have one step, I can walk up a few steps. But if you're in an apartment building with no elevator, I can't quite do that. <laughs> so, uh, so are you doing counseling now online? I'm not. Um, I've been so, um, I think, uh, I guess the, the best word is to say uh, fulfilled with uh, the work that I'm doing with the nonprofit. Um, I've worked with them as a volunteer starting in 2010, and then I became executive director in 2013. So we've been uh, fundraising and uh, working with the baseball league and getting that all up and running has been really uh, rewarding. And I, I think I've definitely, you know, found what I need to be doing for, you know, for at least this time in, in my life. <laughs> I mean, it also seems to me that while you're not doing counseling, you are. Yes. I mean, yes. you're leading by example. And my presumption is you're talking with disabled kids and their families and analyzing what's going on and giving guidance and things of that nature. So your background in counseling, I'm sure is nothing but helpful. Yes, it, I have definitely found it to be beneficial in uh, the work that we do and the interactions that I have with the, like you said, with the families has been really, um, it's been very beneficial to have the background of uh, the psychology yeah. I really so, want to thank you for this discussion. Thank um, you. I think, you know, for your audience, it's a little bit different probably than the one that you do, but I'm really glad that it's not just been a Q on your side and an A on my side, yes. but rather a discussion. Yes. I'm, I'm very grateful for, uh, for both of our time to, uh, as you said earlier, and <laughs> to, uh, just make sure, uh, that this took place and, and I appreciate, uh, I appreciate this time. And we uh, did, I, I really, much. yes, definitely. I really do uh, like this format that, that we did where it was a back and forth, a discussion. And uh, so thank you so much and uh, enjoy the rest of your evening. <laughs> and I think the audience learns about both of us and with other people that you interview because you've got, a really rich background mm -hmm. and maybe people know all about it and I was just learning about it but I think it also draws listeners in to hear so many facets of your life yes. you know how you grew up and where you are and all the diversity you know in your family and school and work and so yeah. we will stay in touch and I'm honored that you called me Oh, and thank you so much. And you enjoy the rest of your evening and we will be in touch. Thank you. Oh, thank bye bye you. everybody. Bye. <laughs> bye. <laughs> thank you for listening to this episode of the Our View podcast. Be sure to subscribe to the Our View podcast on Anchor, Apple Podcasts, or Spotify. New episodes will be released on the 15th and 30th of every month. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube at Our View for Life. That's O-U-R. V-I-E-W, the number four, L-I-F-E. Do you want to help change the tone of conversation among your family and friends? Head over to our website for some Our View merchandise. Our website is www.our-view.com forward slash merchandise. 
For more information on Judy Human, be sure to follow her on Facebook at The Human Perspective with Judy Human, watch her Netflix documentary Crip Camp, and be sure to purchase her memoir, Being Human. Human is spelled H-E-U-M-A-N-N. Thank you for listening and take care.